Hello, and welcome to episode 29 of the Haskin Cast podcast. I am your host, Scott Haskin, and I've got a very, very fun and exciting episode for you guys today. Uh, my buddy Scott Lazinski, that I've known since 1988, spring of 88 when uh, my family relocated from the Detroit area to Colorado Springs, Colorado, and he was going to high school there. He and I had a, a history class together. And I remember when I first met him thinking, this guy's going to be an artist. Uh, he was always drawing, always coming up with ideas, uh, pretty detailed stuff just off the top of his head, doing sketches and notebooks and um I remember thinking very positively that he was going to be somebody that pursued a career in that and uh, would end up doing it. And he's done that. And we talk about that. We talk about the differences between being a freelancer and working in a corporate world, as he is currently working for a corporation as a graphic designer, and the different challenges there. It's it's a really interesting interview because uh, there's a lot of stuff about that world that I don't know because it's not part of what I do. Um, usually I work in more the, uh, the video side of things as opposed to logos and, and that, uh, when I work with Kelly on the album covers, she and I have a, a very specific way that we work. So it's a little bit different than, you know, a, a client coming in and saying, here's what we want and an artist pitching it to them because we're, we're very familiar now after all these years and all these projects that we've done together. Um, so it's really interesting to talk to another artist and, and get their take on, on things. And, uh, you know, we do obviously a little bit of reminiscing and that sort of thing, but, uh, yeah, a lot of interesting and, and fun stuff. And he's such a great guy, really easy to talk to. And I'm so grateful, uh, that he and I connected, uh, a few years back on Facebook. He found me and, and reached out and, uh, it's, it's, you know, there's some people that, you can go 10, 15, 20 years and not talk to and just pick up as if, nothing ever changed, that there is no distance of time or, or location between you. And obviously, we've become completely different people than we were at 16, 17 years old. But it there's still that same connection there, which is really cool. I mean, we connect on a friendship level, but we connect on an artist level as well. Uh, and, and a level of mutual respect and appreciation for each other's work. So uh, it was a great conversation. I, I was really happy to uh, to talk to him. We spoke on Saturday, and then uh, I had a uh, a ticket to go see Vegas, the show over at Planet Hollywood, which I've never seen before. So it, I didn't know very much about the show. I knew it was kind of a, a classic, uh, you know, throwback to the the days of uh, Sammy Davis Jr. and, and that. And, uh, of course, I, I'm not old enough to have ever seen Sammy perform live or Wayne Newton. Uh, I have never had a chance to see him. And so it was it was really neat because they do these really cool uh, versions of these people, but they don't hype it up with costume and, you know, Elvis wearing the big sparkle jacket and or the suit and all that. It's very casual. It's a representation of these people without a, a direct uh, mimicking what they did. So it's a, it's a little more relaxed, but the show moves so fast. There's so many uh, songs or parts of songs that they play. The set is changing constantly. The costumes are changing constantly. Uh, the, there's a full band there. They do some big band stuff. They do a little bit of swing, uh, a lot of classic uh, performer stuff back from like the 60s and the 50s. And uh, it's it's so well done and so amazingly put together. And then right as one of the songs ended a fire alarm went off and I was trying to understand where they were going with that, what the direction was. And then the uh, announcement came on over the intercom, the hotel's intercom that, uh, that said that there was a situation and they had it under control and not to worry and all this stuff. And I'm like, Oh, well, I've heard this alarm before. There was another time I was in planet Hollywood doing something and, and somebody had pulled a fire alarm and uh, it was the same message. So uh, I realized very quickly that it wasn't part of the show. And it was just very well timed that it happened to be literally as the curtain was closing after a song finished and the lights were going down for the change, uh, the fire alarm went off. Almost, It seemed so much that it was part of the show because of the timing of it. Uh, and that went on for an ungodly amount of time. And then the hotel shut that off and they resumed the show uh, without skipping a beat. 
it was very, very professional, very well handled. Uh, but the show itself is phenomenal. Uh, my friend Rachel is the percussionist in the show, uh, and uh, she's got all kinds of things going on up on her uh, pedestal. And then there's the band underneath, and then there's a brass section up on the other side of, of Rachel. And it just a, a phenomenal show. And uh, really glad I, I finally had an opportunity to go see it and took advantage of it. And, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of the big uh, shows, like the Cirque du Soleil shows that are these huge theaters. But, you know, these little intimate shows are really cool, too. Like uh, when I saw Opium or when I saw Jabberwockies, uh, very, very cool. So if, you, if you're in town and you're looking for something that is uh, a nice, fun thing to do, but not something that's in, you know, one of these shows that is going to take you a half hour to get out of the theater, uh, go see Opium. Go see, uh, which is at uh, the Aria. Uh, go see Vegas the show, which is over at Planet Hollywood. Uh, I've not seen, they have a couple other shows over there. Uh, Zombie Burlesque, which I have not yet seen. And I think they've got a couple other shows that are over there that I haven't seen yet. But it's weird because the Planet Hollywood site does not uh, heavily promote these shows. They promote the stuff that's in the big arena where Britney Spears used to play. And uh, they've got, you know, various acts that come in and out. But uh, for some reason, they don't promote the other shows. So uh, you kind of have to search around for them. But uh, but they're out there. And then uh, there's, um, you know, Jabberwockies is over at the MGM Grand, uh, where Cirque du Soleil's Ka also performs. So you can go see a smaller size show or you can go see the big grandiose show. Both of them are fantastic. I did, I never wanted to see Jabberwockies because I'm not like a hip hop dance kind of guy. Don't be shocked. I, I hope you were sitting down when I said that. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's not something I wanted to see. And then I was asked to do a review of the show and I went down and I immensely enjoyed it. And it happened that, uh, Peppa from salt and Peppa was there. I did not see her or meet her. I found out afterwards, uh, but very, very amazingly well done show. Uh, great respect for all these artists that, uh, that put together these phenomenal shows and perform them night after night. It's really impressive. Um, Thinking about the podcast, I, I came across a, a realization the other day that I thought was interesting, and, and I found out I was wrong on the number, but uh, I thought that there was a limit of 250 episodes that you could post on iTunes before they just start deleting the older episodes. Uh, it turns out the number is actually 300, and I thought, you know, that would be kind of a, a good place to, to head towards. You know, I think I'll be able to get enough uh, guests and material to to do 300 episodes over the course of the next, you know, two or three years. Uh, if I only did one a week, that would only be 52 a year. But uh, here we are. I've only been doing the podcast for a handful of months, and we're already at episode 29. Uh, but I, I did front load it, and I've done a couple of special episodes, like my NAM episode on on Monday night, and um, so it's going to be interesting, but I think that would be kind of cool, you know, to, to kind of peek it off and, you know, do the final show as the 300th show that would, uh, that iTunes would stop the feed on so that all of the episodes are there and, uh, nothing gets cut or uh, bumped. So I don't know. We'll see. It, we'll see how it goes. This is still very early on and I'm still kind of shaping the show a little bit. I'd love to get some developers on, talk to a bunch of them at NAMM. And, and a lot of it is really time scheduling around when their actual releases are. Because at the NAMM show, you see things sometimes six, seven months before they're going to hit the market. And uh, they're still in development or they've perfected it and they're waiting for a, a certain schedule of things to happen before they can release it. So, uh, you know, it's it's a real uh, privilege sometimes to see these things, but then come to terms with, well, I'd love to have you on the show to talk about it, but it's not going to come out until May. So let's try and both remember to revisit this around that time. And then you will do the release and maybe a couple of weeks after the release is up, then you'll come on the show and talk about it uh, once the, the initial dust has settled a little bit. Uh, so scheduling is, is usually the biggest uh, challenge. So where I was thinking of maybe the first week of the, the month, I would have a uh, like an actor on. And then the second week, I would have a musician. And the third week, I would have a developer or something. But it, it's really hard to schedule things so that they come out in time. Uh, and you can't record them too early because then people are on to different shows or things change too quickly. So it's a little bit tricky to do things in line that make sense at the time of the release of the podcast. Obviously, if you're listening to this podcast two years after I released it, you know, right now I'm recording this. It's uh, February uh, 4th, 2019. You might be listening to this in July of 2021. 
And uh, obviously, you know, things have going to uh, change in my life in those two years. Uh, things will change in my guest's life in those two years. The product that they've put out, obviously, they've hopefully put out more things by then. And other things have surpassed it because the industry moves so quickly. But the, the relevance of it is still there or it relates to other things that they do or enhancements that they've made. So it's still going to have a relevance over time. But it has the most relevance at the time of release, especially if you're dealing with like a live performer who's doing a specific tour of just released an album. Um, so it's it's kind of interesting, but it, that's the biggest challenge of the show is is scheduling and getting people on between their schedule and my schedule and then having the material being relevant to the current time. Uh, so you can't record too early. But I'm I'm really curious to see how it goes. Um, I'd like to, to get on some kind of specific schedule but I don't really know if that's going to work at this point. So it's kind of who I can reach at the time of uh, like a release of their proj project. Um, I was going to have my friend Alex on, but he's working on an album now. So I've decided to kind of bump that interview until he's ready to release the album. So then he can come on and promote it and talk about it and we can play sound clips and things from it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really fun, but it's, it's interesting to uh, coordinate all of this, but in any case, I hope you guys are enjoying the show. Um, the number of downloads that I'm seeing every show is increasing, which is good. It means I'm connecting with people and, uh, hopefully that you guys are enjoying it and, uh, finding some valuable or inspiring information, if not things that are just interesting as a, a, a fan of art or somebody who's in the entertainment business yourself, maybe in a different facet. Uh, than, than the guests. So um, yeah, it's been great. And I hope you guys are enjoying it. So I'm going to keep doing it. I enjoy it. And uh, we'll see where, where it goes from episode to episode. Uh, before I bring on Scott, uh, I have to give a shout out to Julie Morgan, who was a, a recent guest. And uh, just like Travis Leroy, shortly after the podcast, she got engaged. So I don't know that this podcast is bringing about romance, but hey, if it does, I'm all for it. Uh, <laughs> it it's uh, I, the timing of it is probably just you know completely irrelevant, but uh, but interesting. And uh, I I congratulate both of them. I'm very excited for both of them. They're they're wonderful people. I don't know Julie's fiance, but I know Travis's fiance, and uh, she's wonderful. And I'm sure that uh, Julie's fiance is wonderful. And I uh, wish everybody. Long life, uh, long life, and many years of, of great happiness together. And uh, we'll see who else we can get married off. Uh, thinking about doing some contests down the road, um, I have introduced a new uh, thing that I'm doing called uh, Free Single Sunday where every Sunday I make one of my singles available for free. Those are typically going to be the ones that are CD Baby only. Uh, but uh, if you're interested in that, then head over to my Facebook page. It's going to be uh, – I started it just on my regular page, but I'm going to move that over to the, the group and the like page here shortly. Uh, I'm also going to be starting up a like page for the podcast. I just haven't had the time to sit down and, and actually do it. Um, but, uh, I'm, you know, it's, it's, you're posting things in the same places, but in so many different places that basically do the same thing. I think the easiest thing to do would be to just have a page for the podcast since the audience is growing, the number of guests are growing, the stories are growing. Um, and if I'm going to do some specific contests for the show, it would be good to have them centralized all in one place. So be, uh, I'll, I'll let you guys know when that comes out, but hopefully it'll be in the next couple of weeks. Uh, I was just commissioned to do a film theme, a uh, musical theme for a film. So uh, I'm working on that over the next couple of days. And I'm still working on the Addicted album. I'm hoping to have that done late February, early March. And then in the middle of that, I'm working on a, uh, a single that I'm hoping to be able to release. Uh, I've just recorded the vocals on it. And I'm kind of listening back to see if I'm really happy with it because I'm not a singer per se. Uh, but I can sing some things, so we'll we'll see how that goes. Uh, so yeah, lots of exciting things going on, and uh, let's let's get Scott on the show and and see what he has to say as uh, in the world of graphic arts and a fan of of uh, other artists and music and some really interesting experiences and some great opportunities that he's had, which I'm really excited about because you know when you when you see somebody that's that not I I I don't really know if passionate is the right word because it's 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 just so much in his blood, what he does. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, I can identify with that, but it, I don't 
know who finds what terms offensive or or supportive or what, but I'm just going to say that I'm I'm going to say it's not even passion. It's just a, a part of his blood, uh, much like music and, and uh, writing is in mine, and uh, apparently coffee. Lots of that uh, have taken over my bloodstream, but uh, so hopefully that's not too bad. And uh, while I'm recording this on a nice chilly rainy night here in Vegas. I uh, hope you guys are having a, a wonderful day, a wonderful week. Uh, it's Hopefully you're keeping to your New Year's resolutions for those of you that have done those. And we talked about that on an earlier episode, uh, my feelings on that. But uh hope that uh, you're happy and warm and enjoying the world and doing good things and taking time to do good things for others as well. And without further ado, let's bring Scott on the show. All right, everybody, let's welcome to the show my good friend, Scott Lazinski. Scott, how are you today? I'm great. Thank Excellent. You. Thanks so much for coming on the show. You're a really busy guy, so I appreciate you carving a little time out for me. Yeah, thank you. I'm honored to be uh, part of your podcast, so thank you. Well, thank you. You and I have known each other since the, uh, what, the spring of 1988, when I moved from yes. uh, Detroit to Colorado Springs. And we went to high school together. So we've had a long, healthy, artistically supportive friendship. Yes, absolutely. And you are still in Colorado. You're uh, up in, is it the Boulder area? Uh, Fort Collins. Oh, Fort Collins. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some friends of mine uh, did their first, they, they uh, changed a member in their band. And we did our, the first gig there at a place called, uh, what was it, uh, the Washington, I think? Yeah. And my yeah. uh, my buddy and I, the drummer, were driving up together, and we got lost because this was you know well before GPS and everything. This is like early '90s, and we stopped to get directions at this place called Vern's Tavern. Yep, <laughs> I I love that place because it was a bakery and a souvenir shop and a restaurant and a fishing license store, like just total country type place. Yeah, it's an iconic spot at Fort Collins. It is. Is it still there? Yeah. Burns is there, um, but still here. Uh, Washington's, they actually tore down the bar, oh. and now it's just a music venue. So, Oh, that's awesome. But they, Yeah, they tore down all the, because uh, they used to have the howitzers out front, and um, it was all painted crazy, and they had uh, kind of a music venue downstairs, mm-hmm. and now the whole, they tore the whole front out of it, and then remodeled and rebuilt, and now it's just a music venue. That is so cool because one of the things that I've talked about on the show many times is that there's so few places for musicians to play these days. I'm really glad that there are places like that out there. Yeah, there's there's quite a few uh, little local uh, music venues here at Fort Collins. It's a real um, supporter of the arts. I think being a college town really helps that. Yeah. Um, so Because there's a lot of um, college bands and things that are floating around looking for places to play. So there's enough there's enough musicians to support it, and a lot of really good musicians actually. We've been able to go listen to a lot of really talented musicians for next to nothing. You know, you yeah. Can sometimes just go in and just order a beer. That's like all the costs, and so it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, that's very cool. Well, I'm very glad to hear that, and I hope that that is a trend that will spread quickly across the country, and we can bring live music back. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I have all the respect in the world for people who. Uh, can start a business and I look at DJs and, and what I, it actually takes to be a DJ. And there is a, a certain element of talent there that I respect, but I'm a musician. I want live music. I can't help it. Right. You know, but you're not a musician. You are an artist. And so yes. what I would like for you to do, because a lot of my fans won't uh, be familiar with you just yet, but they are going to be now. What exactly, I don't know how you classify yourself. How do you, how do you explain what you do? Yeah. So I'm a graphic designer by trade. Um, I've been a professional graphic designer for 24 years now. Um, I'm currently the art director for a nonprofit out of Boulder. And on the, I don't want to say on the side because it actually takes up quite a bit of my time. I'm also a comic book writer, illustrator, and um, colorist. So I do, I, I've written some of my own scripts but I also have uh, taken scripts written by other people, done the artwork and the finishing work, and uh, then they go to publication. So, 
that's really cool. Do you uh, do you tend to work with others in collaboration to get the drawing completed, or do you do everything yourself? So far, I've done it all myself. Um, I, I actually just got. I, I've always been a fan of comic books since I was a kid. Um, but it's actually an interesting story. I uh, about two and a half years ago, you know, you, I think everybody hits that middle age point where you start to question it all. And um, it was right before my 45th birthday. I was getting a little frustrated with graphic design because you're constantly uh, working on someone else's thing. You know, with graphic design, you are a communicator between a product and an audience. So you have to bring your creative talent and make things look amazing. But there's other people that are driving what the final product will look like. And that will that will vary... Uh, the outcome will vary based on the amount of leniency that the um, originator of that marketing material gives you. Um, but you're always kind of compromising and not uh, able to put everything that you want into the piece for the final. But really, you're you're being artistic, but you're not truly an artist when you're doing graphic design because you do have to move products. That's your job. So I, um, as someone who's always been a creative person and wanting to have something that is just mine, I kind of really started to think about, I've always had a dream to do comics. Um, so I started a web comic and was really not putting a ton of time into it, but it was something that I could own. It was something that I could make every decision and own the process from beginning to end. So I was writing it, I was penciling it, I was inking it and coloring it. And then I was publishing it on just on a website. And then I also had a page on Facebook and I would just kind of throw it out there. And then I started putting them on Instagram and I, I started a pay, Patreon page not too long ago, um, which, you know, we could talk about that later. But yeah. it's um, I just tried to put it in places where you can put it for very little effort and no cost and just kind of started getting it out there. And um, one, a lot of them were based on video games because I've always enjoyed video games. So the comic, the little strip I was doing was weekly and it was loosely based around World of Warcraft. Okay. And the premise was there's two guys that are roommates and they live with a tauren, which is the cow creatures in World of Warcraft. And the tauren is the antagonist and the two guys are the protagonists. And it's just a messy situation with these individuals living together. Um, so is it kind of like uh, kind of like an odd couple sort of thing in the World of Warcraft yeah, arena? Yeah, sort of, but it was... It, it doesn't look like Warcraft at all. It, it all happens in this apartment. Ah. You know, so it's things like, you know, in the game, the Tauren are these humongous creatures, like they're big cows, basically. And so there's one issue that I did where they're out of beer. So the Tauren is going, hey, we're out of beer, go buy some more. And one of the guys is going, hey, if we're out of beer, it's because you drank it all. You go get your own beer. And he's kind of poking the Tauren in the chest. And then the third panel, the guy that the Torin was talking to has his arm in a sling and he's buying the beer at the store. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just kind of slapstick. Mm -hmm. It was goofy things like that. Just, you know, just goofy ideas that came into my head. Um, I ended up doing, if I recall a little over 80 issues of that. Um, but it was kind of one of those things. It was, I was doing it, but I always knew this was just a step towards something bigger. And because I always wanted to, well, I always loved comics, but I really wanted to author a comic. And I have some ideas, um, and I, I used to write a lot of fan fiction. And so with a couple other friends, we together wrote a um, little over a thousand pages of loosely based um, fan fiction. And uh, one guy, his name's Raymond. He's out of Alaska. He's a great guy. Um, and then, uh, Debbie is the other gal and she lives on the East coast or the other person. She lives on the East coast. And like I said, we, 
we wrote these characters. It was all, even though they were they were based on a fantasy story, it was all our own creation. So there's really no licensing that we have to worry about um, because it was, again, it was just kind of based on a system, but we made it our own. And all the names are different. Like, we don't reference anything in the original um, stories. And from there, I've now taken that and I'm starting to adopt it into a graphic novel. Sweet. So, yeah. Very cool. I love that, but it's, it's been such a natural progression for you too, because you go from, I'm a creative and I have something that I'm a fan of that I really enjoy to, I want to try my hand at this myself to making it a tangible thing. That takes a lot of dedication and work. And where it sounds really simple in the description of that natural progression that's a, a period of years of development, of practicing, of experimentation, and really defining yourself for each individual project. Where you're right, as a, as a graphic designer, much as when I do uh, commission work for a music library or a film, you, you put a little bit of yourself into it, but it's really someone else that has the final say of the, sh the final shape. If you put in a color and they're like, I don't like that light blue at all. You need to get rid of it. That might be your signature thing, but it's up to them because it's not really your project. Your goal is to carry out their vision and make it tangible. That's totally correct. And yeah, so you end up having to sometimes take out what you feel is the best decision. And even that may not be the right decision, but we're artists. We want our thumbprint on stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, that's kind of why we do what we do. And, and that's why they hire you, because they like what right. you do. But they also, when they look at you as a commercial artist, and I'll say it that way, as a graphic designer, yeah. you're an artist in the commercial world. So they look at what work you've done that's been directed by someone else, and they judge you based on that, just as they would me for a film score. And they'll hire you right. based on that, even though that's not completely your voice. So it's kind of a misinterpretation of you as an artist, because it's not what you would put out if you had, if they just said, hey, I needed to design us a new logo for Taco Bell. And you write up what you like, and you put it out there. And they're like, yeah, that's great. We're going to use it. That's you. As opposed right. to, okay, we like that, but can you reshape the bell a little bit? And maybe could we have a little taco over here to the side? Then it becomes right. you that's not you anymore. That's, that's correct. So kind of as a designer, um, you, you bring a style more than anything else. Right. Like you get hired based on your style of design. And you have to be creative. I mean, there's, again, it's a super competitive field. There's tons of really talented young designers coming out of school. I mean, I, I see stuff from 22-year-old designers that I look at and I'm like, wow, <laughs> I, right. I'll, I'll never be that good. Um, but you, you have to bring that creativity into the meetings where they're discussing the projects. And then, you know, so that's, I think my value where I work, um, even though I... I designed some great stuff. And, I, and I'm saying that not because Scott thinks he's a great designer, but because I'm told that by the marketing managers and the director of marketing and then executives even yeah. have approached me and said, you knocked this one out of the park. It's amazing. But you have to go into it knowing that you're not going to own it. Yeah. You, you can't marry yourself to it. You have to allow the product to be the product and not, you have to do the best job you can and put yourself in there and, but know that in the end, you only own a part of the picture. You know, you have to be collaborative. Absolutely. It, was that a, an easy or a difficult lesson for you to learn early on? It was, I went, I went into graphic design knowing that my job was to move product. Okay. And that I would have to work with either the product owner or a manager, like a marketing manager of some kind. Um, I learned it in my internship, actually, because where I interned, they had a project come in that we were all working on. It was five designers and two interns, and we were all in a room working on this project. And we were struggling to come up with an idea. 
And I mean, here's, there's five professional designers that have been anywhere from three to 20 years of experience, fantastic team of designers. And they were struggling to come up with a concept and the bookkeeper walks in with a sketch she did on a post-it note. And she goes, I know you guys were struggling and I don't know if you're interested, but I had this idea. And it, she literally put this post-it note down and the room went quiet because it was the best idea on the table. And that, as an intern, I saw two things. I saw that professionals struggle with ideas and ideas can come from anybody. And, and the way I translate that as I move forward in my career is, yeah, a marketing manager may give me a project, but I have to make sure I listen to their ideas too and not let pride or ego get in the way of what could be a great thing that I get to be a part of rather than just be the person that did. That's a great point. And I think, and this is just my observation, but I think the key to that is knowing what your role is. Because if you right. if you try too much to be an artist and say, it's, it's important for me to put my personal stamp and get my signature on this no matter what, uh, eventually there's going to be a lot of butting heads and the project is going to suffer and you're probably not going to be on the next one. So Correct. you have to find that balance between the two and you can do subtle things that put your, your signature on it. Um, I, I have the same thing in film. If I disagree with the direction uh, that the director wants to go in, then it's not the right film for me to work on. I don't work for a firm or a company. I'm freelance. So I have the ability to do that. Uh, right. You know, you don't want to base your decisions on money, but sometimes you have to do that. Uh, but, sure. but at the end of the day, you have to choose whether it's a good project for you. Have you ever been given anything in, in the corporate world that you've just known was the wrong thing and had to turn it down? Um. You don't have that luxury when you're part of an internal department. If, if there's a project that comes across your desk that you don't want to do, you still have to do it because that's what your job is. Like, that's what they're paying you to do. So I would say, no, I've never turned down a project that was brought to me um, as far as when I've been part of an internal art department. But I, I did freelance for many years. And yes, I would turn down projects that I would go have the meeting, uh, you know, the initial kind of creative meeting, and I would call them back and I would say, yeah, I don't think this is for me. And I, it's never about politics or anything like that. Like, I know some designers that they won't do stuff if, if it doesn't align with them politically, and that's fine. That's their decision. But I have designed things for causes that I completely am opposed to. But it's not about that. And, I, and, and, and those projects, I still put everything I have into it because that's why they hired me. And again, we do need to eat. And, yeah. Yeah. you know, our job, we trade our time for people's money. And so you, you do have to just sometimes say, it's fine. It's, a, it's about the work. It's not necessarily about my own political views or religious views or whatever. It's just like, Hey, it's, it's a good job. It's going to get me some exposure as a designer. Um, it's a, like, it could, it could still be a super interesting project, you know, sure. like it, it could still be a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, we just have to make those choices. Well, that's just it. And I'm not surprised that you would, uh, put everything into a project, even if you weren't happy with it, because you're one of those guys that if you agree to do something, you've agreed to do it. And there's a certain level of quality that comes with hiring you that you hold yourself to regardless of what that project is. And I really, really respect that because I think a lot of people would uh, half-ass it or just say, this is good enough for them because I don't like them as a client or I don't like their message. Right. But you're saying this is what I'm putting out there and it's me doing it, which is more important. And so it has to be that level of quality that I hold myself to more than they do. Yeah. I mean, you can really shoot yourself in the foot as a designer if you do that, because you, your name is on it. Mm -hmm. Like you're associated with it. So if, if you put something out there out of spite, that's not good. It really just hurts you in the end. <laughs> yeah. 
because it, you know, other people might see that and go, well, we're not going to hire that guy. We're going to hire that girl over there because she's way better. Well, not only that, if somebody really likes the work that the artist has done, they might ask them, hey, who did this work? We'd like to hire them for something. And you know what? You're not going to get that call. Yep. That's exactly right. Yeah. Exactly right. And some of that has to do with just work ethic. You know, my, my father, um, he taught me and my brother and sister that when you decide to do something, you do it. Don't, don't hold back, like do it all the way that you can. And he, he not only told us that, but he showed us that because when we moved out here, I was four when we moved to Colorado uh, from New Jersey and he, he had to work two full-time jobs to keep our family alive. And I don't know if he complained when we weren't around, but I, I can't recall one time that he complained about that. Yeah. He just did it. That's awesome. Well, you know, back in those days, though, you had that, I made a family, I'm responsible for this. It wasn't, uh, it was a different world back then. It wasn't about, yeah. you know, putting your, oh, I'm just, I just can't do this today on Facebook. It was, you get up and do what you got to do. Yeah, it's totally true. Yeah. You just, whatever needed to be done, got done. Mm-hmm. And because on top of working two jobs, my dad would come home and like build a deck. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he just never stopped. He just, he was amazing hard worker, you know, and even now he's retired, but he still works part-time retail because he just, he's just, he just works. He's just into it. <laughs> well, it's, it's who he is. I mean, he, he did that for yeah. so long. You almost don't have an identity of being, and I think that's why so many people become miserable when they're retired is they haven't found an identity for themselves outside of their job because they did it for so long and they, they focus so much on that responsibility that they didn't, create anything for themselves outside of that. Right. You know, for, for yeah. me, I mean, I, I, you know, whenever I have to go out into the, the workforce and do anything, my goal is to get back to just being an artist a hundred percent of the time. But you know, in the music industry, it's a lot of lulls. You have times where the commissions are high, you have times where they're not, and you got to make that money somehow. But at yep. the end of the day, I'll, I'll retire from doing that, but I will, I can't imagine ever retiring from writing. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll die with a pencil and staff paper in my hand. <laughs> right. Yeah. And that's kind of where I'm at with the, you know, like getting into authoring and illustrating comics. I mean, I, I had mentioned earlier that it was kind of like, it, 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 was, it, was, it was kind of burned out of, you know, midlife frustrations. Mm. But I'll be honest, there's also a part of me that, like, that I've realized pretty quickly, this is something I can do as I move into retirement years in the next 15 or 20 years, whenever that happens. And because it's something that I can do and I don't care if I make money with it. I just love doing it. You know, it's, it's fun. It's fun making something that hopefully people will love. Right. Like, cause that's really what we do as artists, right? Like when you write a piece of music, you know, you put it out there and you like, I hope people love this because I, I made this. And I think that's what every artist at the core of them, um, they make something and then it takes a lot to put that out in the public sphere and say, what are you guys thinking of this? I hope you love it. Right. And so for me, like doing the comics, um, and especially getting to work with other writers, because now you're collaborating, but there's also that, you know, being the author and also the illustrator for, you know, a couple of the pieces I've been working on, you, you just hope that people love it and that they're entertained by it and, and that it brings some joy to them. And that, that honestly becomes for me enough payment. Now, if I was to make some money, you know, if, if some of it got published in, you know, a larger publication and they, and they paid me, that would be great. I'm not going to lie. Like that would be awesome. But I will work on this for the next 20, 30 years, whatever, even if I'm not getting paid, just a, it keeps me busy. And it gives me something to do and it's something that I love, you know? And so it's, it's either, you know, like my, I hit that midlife point and I'm like, I can either draw or drink. <laughs> and right. I, yeah. And I think I'd rather draw because that's a little healthier. And it's less so. expensive. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but but so, I think that's the thing. For a creative, it's not just a matter of a choice. I think even if you tried to get away from it, it would always be nagging at you. There's always 
I have this idea. I really want to do something with this. It, it's just, it's, it's who you are. It's in you. It's part of your blood. I totally agree. And it's actually interesting. There's a, there's a local um, gentleman here. His name is Ron Fortier. He is a prolific comic book author. Um, I think he has just over a thousand publications, if wow. I remember correctly. Um, he's been doing it professionally for, I think, 44 years, if I remember correctly. Um, he runs a uh, company called Airship 27 Productions, um, which is their, their primary um, product line is pulp style comics. He's a, he's a huge pulp uh, fan. Um, but he's also an extremely accomplished writer for, like, he did a whole bunch of uh, comics for the Green Hornet. Oh, like, wow. he wrote several, yeah, a bunch of issues for them, or for that that character set. Um, like, he's super prolific. Um, but my point with bringing him up is um, he's been a major mentor to me, and he's also um, my editor. Like, anything that I write, he I send it to him, and he'll edit it for me and like, give me great points and, you know, uh, tips on how to make it better. Um, and he, in a conversation with him one time, um, he told me, he said, you are a great storyteller. And I was like, oh, well, thank you. Like, it was very honored for him to say that. He goes, and I told him, I said, well, thank you. That's, that's, I, I'm honored that you would say that. And he goes, yeah, but I'm not saying that to honor you. I'm saying that because you are now obligated to tell those stories. Mm. You know, he said, you, you have to go out and, and put those stories to the public because they're in you and, and you're obligated to put them out there. That's interesting. And I, yeah. And I never thought of it that way, but it, you know, it kind of struck a chord with me because I was like, wow. Yeah. And you know, how many great ideas or great stories were never told or came to fruition because the person that had those great ideas didn't have a mentor that could look at them and say, you have to tell that story because it, because it's in you and it has to come out. Like, and so that has really driven me to keep working because I really do believe that. I think that as a creative person, if you have good ideas, like we're obligated to make society better through our art, you know, and, I don't, I just, I, I strongly believe that. I, I really feel like if you have a talent or an ability, like anybody, I don't care, if, I don't care if it's not even an artistic talent. If you have the ability to build houses, like go volunteer with Habitat for Humanity or something and help them build houses for people. Like, you know, let's let's make it better by the talents that we have. I could not agree with that more. And I think a lot of times, you know, when when I've tried to get to different plateaus in my musical career. Uh, and now as I'm starting one as an author, I'm facing the same thing. I kind of feel like I was given this gift for a reason. So why shouldn't I be using it for the better? You know, and that's obviously with you yeah. know, the Mental Sauna series, I really try to do that. But just just any music or, or anything that tries to inspire people to think or to just feel good or to escape from the, the stressful world that, that kind of will help them move on to the next thing or treat somebody else more nicely – um, I really do feel that. So I, I, I'm so glad you said that. Oh, yeah, thanks. And it's, I, I guess to, to use you as an example, like you wrote that book, um, I think it was What Stays in Vegas. Is that correct? Oh, the What Happens in Vegas, yeah. Oh, What Happens in Vegas. Because I, I bought that from you. Thank you. A few years That's ago right, when yeah. it came out. And, and I read it, and what I loved about it was it was so simple, but incredibly entertaining Good. because it was just you as an artist observing what was going on around you and documenting. Right. And, and that's what I loved about it is it was so just raw. It was just people that you saw saying and doing things and you just documented it. And, and, and that takes an incredible amount of observational power, you know, and I, and I think it's the kind of, observational power that can only come from an artist because we are kind of wired to observe and then duplicate like that's like and and as we duplicate we we interpret like right. through our artistic filters and like when i 
when I read that book, I literally got it in the mail and I finished it before I went to bed because I oh, just wow. couldn't put it down. It was like just, I just kept thumbing through it and I put it down for a minute and then I'm like, oh, I just want to, you know, and, <laughs> and it, it was just, I loved it. And again, it's like, and I, I don't mean to say this in, in an insulting matter, but it was so simple yeah. that it was, that it was also complex. Well, I think that, that there's a lot of beauty and simplicity, and we tend to yeah. uh, want to fill every little minute or every little space with something important. And we tend to forget to let things breathe a little bit. And it's, it's not always what you say, it's what you don't say. And right. a book like that, the goal was that, you know, if you're just, you know, having a tough day or, or you just need a, a laugh or a smile, that you could just pick up that book and open it to any page and find something that will just make you crack up or, or grin or whatever, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And that was what was so great about it. Thank <laughs> you. And, and I would wanted to do it as a coffee table book, but the expense of actually creating it as a coffee table book was astronomical. So yeah, I can I, imagine. Yeah, so I went with the soft cover, and, and I, I'm happy with that. But I'm really glad that that it's had that impact. I've, that's pretty much the the feedback that I've gotten on it. And you know, again, that's what you do as an artist. You put something out there. You hope people will connect with it. But a lot of times, you don't find out that people are enjoying your work. Do you ever, yeah. you know, when you're doing your independent stuff, do you find that to be a difficult thing? Do you get to those points where you're like, "Why am I doing this? No one cares." Um, yeah, I think, I think it's definitely, um, yeah, that pops up from time to time. But again, um, I fall back on what Ron told me, um, quite a lot. Um, you know, I, I, I actually have it written down. It says you're obligated to tell your stories, like, which is a, which is a summary of what he told me. But, um, that's, that's a motivation for me. And then again, like when you, when you find yourself, spending dozens of hours a week working on things, but then it doesn't feel like you spent any time on it or, or you spend a bunch of time on it. And all you can think about is spending more time on it right? <laughs> to yeah. finish it. It, it doesn't, I don't, I don't think that you can get under that cloud because you're just doing it because you want to do it. And I, I try to be, I, I don't, I, I dare not call it maturity, but, maybe it is that I've matured a little that I don't worry too much about will people accept this? I know somebody will. Right. And yeah. I know, and I know not everyone will. In fact, when I used to publish the, the little comic strip, um, some of the comments, the troll comments that you would get are just like, wow. Like I, I had the, the most minor teaspoon taste of what some of these, celebrities and like much bigger names must deal with when, the, when these trolls come out of the woodwork and, and just spout their unwanted opinions, you know, cause I would have people write stuff like comics, not even funny. And the art is even worse, you know? Yeah. And, and, and you read something like that and you can respond two ways. You can go, wow. And, and really get angry. Or you can look at it and go, well, it just wasn't for that guy. Yeah, or or you can look at it and go, is there something in this one that they saw that maybe I was more confident? Like I, I try to take every piece of feedback and analyze whether there's any validity in it. And right. you know, maybe there's something I can find in, in maybe they, they said it poorly or rudely or whatever, but I, I try to look at it and see, you know, is there some some valuable some something in their statement that I can take. Uh, but in something like that, I mean, it's just obviously somebody that wanted to be hurtful, whatever their reason is, maybe yeah. they're, maybe they wanted to be an artist and it didn't work out or they had to give it up or, or whatever. So you don't know where it's coming from, but right. I just find that I don't get that. I don't understand that mentality. If you don't have something, can, you don't have to only post if you like something. I don't mind people saying they didn't like it, but there's a way to go about it. That's not that. I totally agree. Like, again, I, I go at it knowing like this isn't going to be for everybody. But one of the things that I've done just as a curiosity is a couple of those really negative comments, I would click on their profile and go look at them. And I got to be honest, like a hundred percent of the time, they're not a creative person. There, there's like nothing on their profile, but like rude comments and, you know, really, you know, just a bunch of dumb selfies. <laughs> and, you, and you're just like, Oh, so that's just who you are. Like, you're just, I guess, a negative person. 
Um, and you just have to look at it from that point too. Like I, I totally agree with you. Like when somebody says something, it's it's kind of hard to step back for a minute and just go, well, what's their story? Like what what is their story that brought them to this point that made that comment? You know, because they could wake up like with you know they had bad Thai food the night before and they're just not feeling good. Right. You know, you just don't know. And I and I do try to have that awareness. But at the same time, there is that little bit of you, again, as an artist, where when you put something out there, man, it, it's it's hard to not feel squashed if somebody says something really hurtful or negative about it. It's, really, it's hard to not feel that pain. It is, because you feel like they're not attacking your art. You feel like they're attacking you because your art is an extension of who you are. It's part of you. 100%. And I I remember with the Vegas book, I I got a guy who put on some negative feedback that uh, said he he didn't like it because it wasn't a story about Vegas. And I felt I was pretty clear in the description (laughs) of what the book was, that it was, you know, 450 phrases of things I actually heard people say. It wasn't a story. It wasn't promoted as a story. Um, So when I went to do the second book, I did a very specific what this book is and what this book is not paragraph. Uh, right. because I wanted to be very clear so that, you know, when, when you read it and you see feedback, you can look at the description and go, okay, well, this guy obviously just saw Vegas and clicked on it, you know, uh, and, and, you know, I'm sorry, you don't like it, but you're right. Not every piece of art is going to be for everybody. There's some things that connects with a lot of people and there's some things that will only connect with two or three people and you relish those two or three and the people that didn't connect with it, it just, you know, the, the, the lines didn't ver- uh, merge for those people. But it's tough not to take it personally when, you know, you get excited because somebody said something about what you created and then you find out right. it's that and you're like, oh, totally. it's totally true. You get a, you get that little notification. You're like, oh, somebody said something. And then you read it and you're like, oh, yeah. Like one, one, of, one of the most uh, popular tracks that I've got right now on SoundCloud is, uh, is an audio cleanup job I did on an EVP. And uh, this this uh-huh. uh, mom and her son were in the car and they were talking and there's this third voice that comes in out of nowhere. And I did a, a little bit of, uh, you know, digital cleanup on it. And I posted it on my SoundCloud and more people are liking that than they're liking my music. And I'm like, oh, you know what? <laughs> you get the notification, you, know, you get the SoundCloud notification. You're like, somebody likes one of your tracks. I'm like, oh, cool. Which one was it? Oh, it was the ghost again. Okay, well. I got music too. Right. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> but but one of the oh, things that I did is, is I've done research on my novel and I reached out to, to a lot of my friends. I found out that a lot of people were listening to my music that I had no idea even knew or cared about what I did. So I had oh, a specific situation where I was able to put myself out there. But for you, it, it, you know, you probably have a lot more people reading it and maybe they'll click like and they won't say anything, but you probably have a lot more people enjoying your stuff than you know, which is kind of sad as an artist, because that's one of the things that fuels you when you know people love your stuff, you want to work even harder. Yeah, it's totally true. Um, And it's interesting you bring that up because I had one of the strips that I did had about 22,000 views. Wow. On Instagram. That's awesome. Yeah. And yeah, and it was, it was cool, but there was maybe five comments. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's just like what you said, like when you know 22,000 sets of eyes have looked at it, but five people took the time to say something, you, you don't know, did they like it? Did they not like it? Then you're left wondering. This is something I talked to uh, my last guest, Robin, on the last uh, Split podcast was that um, you people don't really seem to take the time, even friends that will say, yeah, I'll do a review for you. If you get one out of 10 people that say they'll do it, actually do it, that's a sadly good percentage. I mean, 10%, yeah. um, you know, it takes a few seconds. And I think most people have good intentions, but then they get distracted. They forget everybody's busy and their focus is all over the place. So I get it. I mean, I'm not not upset at those people, but you kind of have to learn after a while that the what what the proper ratios are. I would think yeah. for 22,000 views, yeah, you'd have more comments, even to just, hey, cool, man, or something. Yeah. You know? Right. But the fact that right. that many people took the time is kind of the new comment. Yeah. It's just not as nice as it could yeah. be if, if they were more interactive. Yeah, that's true. So I guess, you know, in the end, you just have to 
the people that do support you and the people that do say something nice, you just let that be the fuel. And yeah, you know, and, and some of it too, like, like I said earlier is just, just do it cause you love it. Just do it cause you're satisfied with the creative process. Yeah. You know, that, that to me is the most important thing is just do it cause you love it. Right. And, if, and if you get some money out of it someday, great, but just do it cause you love it. Like leave something behind. Like we all, we all eventually, you know, leave this place right. and leave a little something behind, you know? Right. So. <laughs> well, somebody, somebody said to me, once you put out a piece of art, you have become immortal at that point, because yeah. whatever you've put out, whether anyone ever looks at it or, or, or enjoys it, um, it's out there forever, which makes you immortal. And that really kind of weighed heavily on me for a little while because it made me feel a lot more responsible than I realized I was when I first put out that piece of art. And I went, wow, that's, that's a pretty uh, high pressure thing because people are going to judge me for eternity now, <laughs> not just while right. I'm here to hear it, you know? Right. And what about those crappy sketches that you put up that, Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But you know, if, if, but if you look at like most people, I think if you do it in a chronological way, and you can say, okay, well, this was when I first started out, and then people can go, oh, well, look at how far you've come. You know, the intelligent people will do that, and the other people will go, well, that's stupid. You suck. Right. You know. <laughs> right. Now, do you? You yeah. said that you talked to, uh, before about you know a lot of the younger artists that are out there. Do you find, as I do in music, that the the price point when when you're bidding for a job, or or maybe because there's there's more competition in the corporate level, does that become an issue in your world as as it does mine? Because you get musicians that are like, well, I'll do it for free because I just need to get credits, or you know, I need to build my resume. Whereas I'm past that, and now I'm comp- but I'm competing with those people at the same time. Yeah, that's that's a really um, it, it, it's definitely a place of so I've I've noticed that I don't freelance um, because the place that I work for I feel like if you're employed by somebody you shouldn't be freelancing um, like I, sh- I guess I do have one guy that I still do work for his website but it's completely different product than where I work and it, and, it, and he's a, he's a great guy that um, I've been doing work on his site since prior to my employment with uh, where I'm at right now. And because it's not um, associated in any way with the field that I'm working in professionally, I still continue to do his work. But other than that, I don't, I don't really do any freelance, but I can tell you that um, freelancer prices have dropped significantly as the market has become more saturated. And I think one of the bigger issues that has caused that to happen are a lot of these logo and design mills that are putting logos out for like 25 bucks. Um, unfortunately, it, it, it takes what should be a fairly valuable product and it cheapens it because if you pay $25 for your logo, you're going to get a $25 logo. It's And, and what I mean by that is it's going to be something that was not designed specifically for you. Because what these design mills do is they just churn out marks, like little logo symbols. And then when you, like, so if Scott Haskin uh, uh, contacts one of these places, they just grab a few of those. They do a little font treatment and they shoot it back at you. They didn't take the time to talk to you, get to know you, understand your business, understand what you're after, understand how you want to market yourself, and then design something specifically for you. But because of the cost of doing business, hey, I understand why sometimes you get some some ladies trying to start a business and you know, she needs a logo because you need a logo to distinguish yourself. And, you know, why, why spend $2,500 with a professional designer when you could just go to one of these services and get one for, you know, 25 or 50 bucks. And th- the problem is what I just said. It, yeah, you have a logo, but is it, is it really your vision? Is it your dream? Like I always prided myself um, as a designer when I would, talk to a client and and get to know what is your dream? 
Let me help you envision your dream so that I can make something that represents that. And that's what you're paying for. And even still, like with, like we, we have several freelancers in our design pool that I manage and their prices for their freelance rate are half what I was charging 15 years ago. And I know that these are designers, not they're great designers, all of them. Um, Cause that's why we, that's why I continue to hire them because they do a great job for us. But I'm just like, I'm so glad I'm not a freelancer now because you know, I mean, you as a contractor know that when, if you charge a hundred bucks an hour, you can immediately chop $35 of that off per hour, like taxes and social security gone. And then you start chipping into your overhead and all of a sudden you're making $40 an hour, which isn't horrible money, but it's not like you're not making fantastic money. Yeah. You're not what you're not making what you should be making for the work that you do. Right. And, and some of these designers that we're using are charging a lot less than a hundred dollars an hour. And it's just like, wow, I don't know how, unless they're working 80 hours a week, I'm just not sure how they're doing it. Yeah. Well, one, one thing that, that, uh, I didn't understand, uh, when I first used it, cause I, I experienced that myself before I hired, uh, Rebecca Poole, who does all my lettering now, uh, I had a girl that I had hired over fiverr.com and uh-huh. me knowing very little about graphic quality, I can just say, Oh, I like that. Or I don't like it. I don't know the, you know, the market and, and all that for it. That's, I trust the people I hire to know those things. But what I found out was that the reason that they can charge five and ten dollars for a lot of the projects that they do that that would take me seven or eight hours to do is because they live in countries where that amount of money is much different than the value it is here. That might yeah. be like what what we would charge for an hour, they could charge for a day because right. the value is different for them. But what yeah. I learned on the last project that I did uh, with this particular girl was that she did not have any creative control over it. She had a package of stock fonts and she would just pick one that looked kind of cool and me not knowing any better would go, Oh yeah, I like that. And, but when I asked her, can we do something that's a little bit more like this? Well, I don't have that kind of font. I only have, you know, 30 different fonts to choose from. And I went, Oh, wait a minute. I thought you were more of a designer. What you really are is you're more of a production you know, and so that that was the last project I did with her because I'm like, if I want anything yeah. creative now that I'm learning more about this and getting a little more intelligent, um, a I can't trust your opinion because you really don't have the professional backing to know what's going to pop and what isn't, and that's part of what I hire you for. And B, right. you're not going to be able to deliver an idea that I have because you just don't have the means to do it. Yeah, and and I, I think that those services kind of prey on the ignorance of the, the non-creative. Right. And, and I, I don't mean ignorance in a negative way. It's like, if you don't know something, you're ignorant of what's possible. Sure. Yeah. Um, but these, these design mills, um, that's exactly what they do. They, they have production artists that have a set of pieces and then they just kind of match them together. And that's how they're able to churn them out so fast. Whereas, you know, when I was freelancing, if, if you came to me and wanted a logo, I'd spend, you know, 15 to 20 hours crafting your logo. And you would get, you know, uh, when I would start a process, and I still do this um, to the extent I'm able to, um, if, if I have a project that needs a design solution, I'll sketch, just sketch out ideas. You know, I'll do like 50, 60, 70 sketches. And then narrow that down to a few that I want to produce. And then as I'm producing, I'll generate kind of more ideas. And then from there, I will present three. And it's actually funny because there's a couple people where I work that I have allowed to see the mess of my screen while I'm in the process of designing. And (laughs) I will have three things on the artboard. But if I zoom out, they'll be sometimes 50, 60, 70 variations sure. that sit off the artboard that the, the stakeholder who made the request never gets to see. 
but that's the difference between a professional and someone that's just churning it out. Well, and that's your developmental process. I mean, you, you don't just sit down and draw the final project. I mean, you've got you to right. experiment. you got to, well, what if I did this? What if I shaded it this way? What if I put this over here? It's a, it's a, a whole process. It's not just a, okay, here's your, you know, here's, here's my idea. Here's what I want. And then you're just like, okay, here it is. It, it just doesn't yep. work that way. It's a process. Part of that process is you design and then you present. And then you design and you present. And in between those presentations, there's a mess of other designs that through the refinement process. Right. And and that's what that's what makes a logo belong to the person that you designed it for. That's what makes it something that no one else will have. Mm-hmm. Because you're collaborating with a business owner or a stakeholder of some sort. And, and you move through that process until everybody goes, that's the one. We've, we've created this beautiful thing. Well, how, how is the balance, though, between uh, you know, their, their feedback and your feedback as far as you know, how much fight do you have to say, okay, this is really what makes this pop and this is really what's going to be visual to the customer and make them interested in this logo and that's what they're wanting to take out because they maybe don't have that education to, to know what pops. Yeah, it really varies from person to person. Um, I have people that I work for um, it, where, where where I'm employed that will say, you're the designer, we just need you to do something. So please bring us some ideas and then we'll discuss them. And then there's other people that you design and they just want to be a part of every single change of every single pixel through the entire process. And so, so what gets hard is Having the confidence to say, listen, you're this and I am the designer. You know, like you're, you're whatever role they are and I'm the designer. So, yes, we will discuss this, but, but know that what I'm doing is in the best interest of making your thing look as good as possible. Right. And, and most of the time people will go, yeah, you're right, you're right. But there is also that there's an old, you know, the old adage, everybody thinks they're an artist. Um, there are people that, you know, you are going to have to work with that even though they can't sit down and do it themselves, want to do what they want through you. And when I used to freelance, I would get that occasionally. You would get that person. And at some point I would just, and and you start to realize it earlier and earlier in the process as you get experience, but you would hit that place where you finally just go, you know what, I'm just going to do it the way they want I'm going to put as much of myself in as I can, but I'm just going to do this for the paycheck. And then we're just not going to work with them again. Cause especially when you're a freelancer, you don't want to fire a client because then you're basically just throwing that money away and you have to pay your bills. But you do have to kind of realize there are certain clients that you're going to work better with than others. And do you have to find that balance of, you know, where, where is it that you finally just go, that's fine. This one's just for the money. And you hate to have to go there, but sometimes you have to. Well, but but you said it earlier. You said everything that we do, we're trading, right? We're trading our time for yeah. one thing or another. So if I'm going to trade my time to work on a project, I mean, yeah, there is the, the pay element, but taking that aside for the moment, if I'm going to work on a project, it has to be with somebody that I'm going to be able to work with because right. what I'll have to go through to earn that money is usually not worth the stress of whatever that paycheck is. But there are times right. when if that's the only gig you've got and you got to buy groceries and insurance is coming up and you got to put gas in the car, you got to do what you got to do. You know, you got to buckle down and yeah. find a way to get the job done. But also yeah. you have to be careful of, is this somebody that is going to turn around and badmouth you all over the place and ruin your reputation? And so you want to finish the job and be polite and then just not be available to work with them the next time. Right. And that's, that's right. And as you do become a diplomat <laughs> as an artist, you have to find that level of diplomacy you do? to be able to discuss. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, it's tough. and, you know, and as a, as a freelancer, you have a lot more leeway to not work with somebody again. You know, if you're in an employment situation, which most designers are, you just have to learn to, to work with that person. You have to find that level that you can work with them. Cause you know, I, I, as far as I know, I work well with everybody at my job. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm the art director there. I deal with a lot of different stakeholders and as 
I've, I've not heard anything from anybody else that suggests that I'm a real pain to work with. Now it could be that I just don't know that. Um, <laughs> well, but, I can't. I can't but, imagine <laughs> that though, because you're because I know you as a person. I mean, we've known each other <laughs> for years. But yeah. but yeah, I mean, you would like to think that obviously that's that's the case, and I, I'm sure that if it wasn't, you would have heard somewhere along the line. Now, some of the clients right. may not find that, but they don't get to know. They only know you through that project. They don't get to know you beyond that. Right. And a client can just take their checkbook and go somewhere else if they don't like working. Right. Yeah, exactly. If they work with me and they don't like me, they can just, they can just go, well, I'm not working with him again. And they, they go find someone else. Yeah. When, when you're in more of a, when you're in an employment situation, now you're, you have to work with each other. And it's just trying to find that place and knowing how to adjust your work style. Because the designer, I, I know a lot of designers, obviously, from just being in the field. And we are the ones that are kind of um, tasked with adjusting our work style to the other people in the office. I don't know a single designer that would say, oh, yeah, everybody adjusted their process so that it fits in the way I want to work. Right, yeah. You know, I have a dozen stakeholders that I work for, and I have to work 12 different ways. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's just learning to adjust. And I'll admit it's hard. But that's part of your job. You have to adjust the way you work to match their work style. If someone likes to work in Google Docs, you do that. Right. If they like to work through email chains, you just do that. And and you can try to say, hey, listen, it, it would be easier for me if we did this in a Google Docs so that everything's in one place. And they and they can literally just go, yeah, I don't work that way. Or they can try it. Right. Well, I think it, in, in a lot of times it, de- it depends on how you approach it. Yeah, exactly. You could say, have you guys tried this? I found that this might work better because of this or that. And either they're going to accept it or they're not. If they don't, you just go, okay, right. then we'll do it this way and you move on. But that's the beauty of getting the repeat business is because once you've worked with somebody and you've hashed out that, that uh, difference of, of style, when they come back, you know who they are, how to work with them, and it makes the second and third and fourth projects so much easier than the first one. Because the first one is a lot of times you guys are cutting teeth together and trying to understand each other. But by the second and third one, you, you're you past that now. That's totally true. You, it, It's just finding the balance, you know? Right. And and that that can be hard. <laughs> it can. Uh, and, and I definitely experienced the same thing in, in my world. Um, sure. I want to ask you about a couple other things um, before we wrap yeah. up. Uh, now you're obviously, you know, you're, you're married to one of our uh, high school friends and uh, yeah. you have a family since you work yeah. the, the, at the day job and then you come home and you draw, how do you find that, that work j- enjoyment in artist and family balance? Yeah, that's um, for starters. I am married to probably the single most um, loving and tolerant woman on the planet. Um, she, she has always been behind me when I do any project, no matter how goofy it is. Um, so she is very understanding of, of my need to keep creating. So, so that is just, I, I got lucky. <laughs> I think that's important for sure. I mean, you yeah. have, you have to have that as an artist, otherwise it's just not yeah. going to work. The, to answer the question, it's really, for me, I have tried to identify the moments where they're not around and then work in those moments. Um, one, of, one of those moments that I, I do it a lot is I'm a real early riser. And so I get up in the morning, typically 4.30 or 5, and I will work until everybody's up. And then, you know, if there's times during the day that, you know, everybody's kind of doing their thing, I'll just go sit down and work for an hour. And I just try to fill, I I don't get a ton of, I'm just going to sit down for eight hours and do this. It's a lot of like spotty through the day sort of stuff. And, you know, I, I work from home two days a week and then three days I'm in the office. And when I, when I work from home, I'm usually logged in, um, by six to start working. But what I'll do is if I get up at four, I'll just work for two hours on my comic. And then, and then I'll work and I'll, you know, I'll work till the end of my day. 
And then, you know, a lot of times my wife will be out with friends or, you know, uh, she's really good close friends with our neighbor across the street and they get together a lot. And, and as they're kind of together doing their thing and before the kids have gotten home, I'll sit down and, you know, I'll work an hour. And then I don't tend to stay up too late because of how early I get up. But if there's those nights where, where I'm up and, you know, kids are off doing homework and, you know, my wife's off doing something else, I'll sit down again on my drawing table and I'll just keep working. And that's what I've tried to do is just find those, those spots in the schedule. So it's, my work is never planned. It's, right, it's yeah. always more spontaneous. The only planned work I do is typically in the morning. Um, cause nobody's off. It's quiet in the house. That's usually when I'll throw on a little music and really, you know, just real quiet. I have a little speaker next to my work, my, my drawing table and I'll just real light music to kind of drown out the environment. And then I'll, I'll just concentrate for a couple hours. And that's probably when I do my best work, to be honest, because it's very focused and it's very quiet. And that's how I like to work. Well, you know that you're not going to be you're not going to be needed for anything, and I think that's why a lot of, a lot of artists like to work overnight is because there's yeah. not going to be a lot of likelihood of phone calls and text messages and emails coming in. It's a time where yep. you can really just know that you're you can focus because you're not going to be pulled out of it. So that makes a lot right. of sense. And that's when I do like the drawing part. That's when I'm doing the sketching and the character poses and all the kind of pieces that make a panel really nice. The other stuff, like when you do the sketch and then the blue line, which is the, your final sketch, the inking and the coloring, you can do that in 10 minute increments. You can just sit down and what's called the flats is when you do the flat coloring. There's no, there's no creativity in that in terms of you're not adjusting poses or adjusting head space or whatever. You're just, the, the skin is this color for, for this character through every page. Right. So I'll just select that color on the palette because I, I work digitally. Um, and then I'll just go through the pages just one at a time. And I'll just color the faces, like right. as many as I can get done in, in 10 minutes. And because you don't have to focus for that. Like people can interrupt me when I'm doing that and it's not a big deal. Right. Yeah. But when I'm trying to work out a character pose and then someone comes up and asks me a question, it, I'm, I'm sure you know this as a creative as well. It throws you out of the creative process and then it takes 10 minutes to get back into the creative process once you're done being interrupted. So that's why I've tried to find those moments where I'm like, okay, this is the time where I can do the drawing part. And then these are the parts where I can do more of the production part. Well, and that's it because like when I'm working on a film or I'm working on a project that a client has hired me to, to mix or, or record or whatever, um, it is tough because I have to be available for them if they have a, if they send me a text or, or call me or whatever. But at the same point, I kind of want to shut off my phone and shut out the world so that I can focus and not lose that 10 minutes it takes me to get back into it but right. when you're when you're just jumping in and out of it like that if you're not doing coloring if you're having to do the more creative part do you find it easy to just jump back into it like when you first start in the morning or when you've got that hour in between when everyone's away is it easy to just jump in and out yes and no i i I, I, are you talking like from day to day, like from Monday morning to Tuesday morning, the gap in between that, or if I'm interrupted? Yeah, even like from the morning to you come home and you've got a free hour at night that you can sit down and work. And you're like, okay, great. And you go in and you turn on the computer. Do you just jump right in or does it take you a little bit to get your bearings on that project? Typically, I can jump back in because like I said earlier, when I'm not working on it, I'm still thinking about it. And so I'm able to kind of mentally prepare and jump back in um, at the point where I left off and I try to finish. I try to never leave a panel unfinished when I quit. So that way you can at least know like, okay, that panel's done. So this is the next panel. So I'm not going to start that because I only have 10 minutes left. Right. And, yeah. you know, so, so I kind of try to find good stop points. And one of the things that's awesome about Sherry is, you know, when I'm working, if she sees me working and she does need to talk to me, she will come over and just say, Hey, when you have a moment or when you're at a stopping point, I need to talk to you about something. And I'll go, Oh, okay, great. And, and that's really not an interruption. I mean, I right. could take a question. It's more like, Hey, I need you to come and hang this mirror. You know, that's an interruption. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So, um, so she's really, really aware of my work style. And some of that is, you know, we've been together for 30 years. So sure. we just know each other well, but she will come over and just say, you know, Hey, we have a second. Oh yeah. Okay, great. And then I'll hit a stopping point and then I can go and I can give her my full attention. 
Yeah, I like that because it, it, it allows you to, to communicate without having to stop. Right. That's good. Exactly. Well, you mentioned yeah. that, uh, that you play music. And uh, before we started recording, you told me a, an interesting story for I, I don't, I've never heard of a graphic artist getting a music copyright infringement. What happened there? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I was, I was, live, I was uh, live streaming on Facebook. And I had uh, some jazz playing in the background. And during the live stream, it, it, I, I think it was a 15-minute stream. And when I finished, you know, I, I turned it off and I went to save it. And then it looked like it was saving. So I just shut my phone off. And then I got a notification. So I brought my phone back up. And it said that the video could not be published because of a copyright infringement. And, you know, at first I'm going... Well, I was drawing. Like that's mine. Like right. there's no. I, I give myself permission to publish this. You were right. Yeah. <laughs> but I then you know as I kept reading, it was it was a music copyright, and I just and I kind of went, oh, I was playing music because I always have music playing in the background when I'm working. And so yeah, I I mean technically yes, it was a copyright infringement, but it was like really completely totally by accident. Like yeah. You know and. And it just kind of made me realize, it, there was two things I realized. I was like, wow, that's amazing that they have software that will detect that. Um, but then I started thinking about, like, wow, how many times do you accidentally infringe on copyright and don't even know it? Sure. You know? Sure. What if it's a so, song it didn't recognize or, you know, something maybe you played that was a little more obscure? But yeah. when, uh, when I first started doing my own uh, music videos for Mental Sauna, I actually started getting a slew of... In one day, I think I got 16 copyright infringements from CD Baby through YouTube wow. because, and, and CD Baby is my publisher. So I'm yeah. like, why are you, you know, I wrote this, you've got it on your site. Why are you coming after me? And and it turned sure. out that it was because it, they didn't connect that it was me putting out different versions of my oh, own music. Wow. So I had to go through a process with them. But like you, I was amazed that they had that technology. Uh, yeah. And then recently, when I put my uh, podcast that I did uh, with my friend Travis Leroy, um, he's in uh, that 80s band in Colorado. And uh -huh. there was a version of a Billy Idol song that we had put a 10 second clip up. And I'm thinking, well, this is a media broadcast. So I should be able to do, I think it's like 15 seconds or whatever. But immediately the, I was flagged for it. And I thought, wow. well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to mess with it. And I just took the episode off of YouTube where it is, it's still on Spotify and iTunes and all that other, because they don't have the same filtering software. Uh, right. I didn't know that Facebook did, but I'm kind of glad to hear that at the same point. Yeah. It's, it was, it's pretty crazy. I it, guess the only it, thing I should, uh, I'll get your permission and I'll just always do mental sauna in the background when I'm drawing. Well, I, yeah, okay. and I will give you, <laughs> and I'll totally give you free license for that. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I had, uh, I, I, I like to do as you do. I like to do things the right way. And I know that if you had realized that that could happen, that you wouldn't have done it. But, uh, I had a cover of a Lionel Richie song that I wanted to do. I wanted to do like a really dark haunted version of uh, the song. Hello. And, uh, so I wanting to do things the right way. I, uh, contacted the, there's two publishers on the song and I contacted them through ASCAP and, uh, they said, well, okay, well, we need to hear the song. And I thought, okay, well, I guess now I have to record it. So I recorded it, and right. they were both okay with it. And then they said, well, Lionel Richie actually has uh, rights to have the final say. And you know, a lot wow. of artists don't. A lot of artists, the, the music is owned by the publishers. They just get their royalties, right. and they don't know the song anymore. Um, so I had to wait another, I think it was two and a half months, to find out that his response was no. Just no. Oh, no. And I mean, granted, it was it's a pretty dark version of the song. So if he didn't like it, I understand that. I have, sure, you know, I have my arguments with it. It's like that song's out there. It's done what it's going to do. And, you know, uh, but I respect that. As an artist, I, I don't know how I would feel if somebody did something with one of my pieces. So uh, it's fine. But, but most people, I think, nowadays would just throw it up there and not worry about it. And if it doesn't get flagged, it doesn't get flagged. And if it does, no big deal. They just take it down. Uh, that's tough. I mean, how would you feel if somebody took one of your characters and did their own comic strip out of one of your original characters? Yeah, I mean, it's it's with the proliferation of I, um, information that we have in this day and age, it's definitely a possible. And I, I've actually had work stolen, like design work, um, but you know, you just 
I guess you just have to understand and accept that that may happen. It just, you just have to say, yeah, it might happen. And if it does, you know, if, if it's a big enough deal, you can pursue it. But the fact is it, it happens all the time. And it's a, it's a sad state of affairs where you have to have that attitude like, yeah, it's probably going to happen. Right. But it, it probably is going to happen. And, and it, it could be like blatant and purposeful, or it could be, totally by accident you just never know but i mean obviously for something like me if like someone took my strip that i a strip that i did and then just put new letters on it then yeah that would be pretty brazen but you know i guess at what point do you decide hey i put it on the internet so i made the choice to put it out in that sphere and that happens so you know you can't watermark everything it's just you just can't you know like i have a deviant art account where I put a lot of my stuff and I um, just know people are probably going to right click and download this if they like it, you know, and I've, I've tried doing the whole, like, uh, you know, make this available for people to buy a print, but no one's ever bought. Right. But I'm yeah. sure people are just downloading it, you know, cause I'm, because I'm a designer, because I have a kind of an attention to quality, I never put watermarks on my stuff and I never put, um, low res versions uh, because I want people to see it the way that I did it. Sure, and so yeah. I don't want a compromised version of that. So I just do it knowing like, hey, someone may download this. Hopefully if they download it, they're just doing it because they want it as their desktop pattern or something. They're not doing it because their plan is to print copies and, you know, sell them or whatever. Sure. It, it's just kind of part of the deal. But it's like you said, going into the commercial world, you knew that there are certain compromises that you have to make between being an artist and being a professional artist. And it's yeah. kind of like the same thing. If you are willing to put your stuff out there, you know that there are chances that people are going to record it and rebroadcast it or uh, copy and paste it or you know manipulate it or print it and sell it to people themselves. I mean, if, you, if you're not willing to have the those consequences you shouldn't put your stuff out there in the first place because it's gonna, right. it, it, there is a chance it's going to happen and you think about how easy was it for us back in the day to take our our record player which had a cassette recorder in it and just record an album and make a mixtape and hand it to your friend we didn't think about yep. copyright infringement back then it wasn't nope. you know, it wasn't even a thought no nope, you know? it wasn't and yeah i mean i used to make tons of mixtapes and every one of those mixtapes was illegal yeah but it didn't even occur to me that it was illegal Exactly. But it was, technically. And we weren't trying so, yeah. to do something that was wrong. We just didn't really think about it. I mean, we thought, well, we bought the album, so we want to share it with, with people. And, you know. Yeah. We just thought Immigrant Song was amazing and we wanted our friends to hear it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, and, and, you know, uh, one of the things that I, I love since I've known you for so long is I remember uh, when I first moved to Colorado in, I think it was April of 88, and I started school in our sophomore year. Uh, May 1st, and our last day was June 1st. So I went to, to our school in Colorado for an entire month of our sophomore year. But you were one of the right. first people that I met. And I remember thinking, like, you're a really nice guy. That was my first impression of you. But I used to, I sat in history class with you, and you, all you did was draw. Like, it was so much <laughs> a part of you. I don't know how don't you know. ever passed any classes because you just, I that's all either. you did. <laughs> I know. It's totally true. And it's funny because I, the story that I got published in Front Range Tales, um, that story is about, a, it's basically my, it's a five or no, eight page autobiography of me. Um, <laughs> because <laughs> the story, the story is about a, a guy who is trying to court a girl through school, but she's a popular kid and he's an artist. And he's drawing all the time and she doesn't get it. And then he meets someone that gets it. And then he becomes a published artist. And I know that sounds like a lot in eight pages, but it actually flows really well. And uh, the amazing artist, Rob Davis, um, did the art for it. And I was so honored that he did it because he's very picky about what he illustrates. And he loved the story too, because he, it resonated with him. Um, but, but yeah, that story, like in the story, like I said, it's a caricature of me, and I'm just drawing during class. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> how right. I remember you. Yeah. That's all I did in class. I, I I'm with you. I don't know how I I don't know how I passed 
any classes <laughs> except my art classes. I right. Know how well, yeah. Goes. I, but I'm not saying that I was never sent to the principal's office for drumming on desks because that may have happened a lot of times. <laughs> and, and at some point, they, yeah, I do. I would go in, and he goes, "Are you going to stop?" I'm like, "I've tried. All right, just go back to class." And, right. and you know, right. But uh, but yeah, it, it is. It's not what we do. It becomes who we are. And I'm really excited to see that you're getting some of your stuff published. Tell us about that. Yeah. So there's. Um, a publication that it's a local publication that you can, I mean, you can, if people can, if anyone's interested in buying it, they can contact me like just through Facebook, but it's um, Ron Fortier, who I've mentioned in the, uh, during this, he does a comic called front range tales. And what it is, is it's aspiring writers and authors. Um, he makes little anthologies of their work and he's actually almost done with issue three. Um, he just started this last year, and I'm in issue two. I'm the third story in issue two. There's three stories in it. And I wrote the story under his tutelage. And it, I, like I said, uh, Rob Davis, who's also, he's been illustrating comics for, you know, 44 years, I think, 50 years. He did the art for it, and then it got published. But Ron does everything through independent publishing. So, the, uh, the local comic shop has it, but if you want to buy it, you actually have to like contact one of the one of the artists or one of the writers to get a copy of it. And part of that has to do with um, the way that the comic book industry works with distribution. Diamond Publishing is the only distributor of comics, and if you're not a humongous player in the business, they're not even going to talk to you. So, but Ron has his whole career; he has done independent publication. And so that's what he's teaching me to do. And that's what he teaches everybody. Like he's the one that runs this um, coffee clutch that I go to on the first Saturday of every month. And he's basically teaching all of us. There's a whole bunch of us that go and he's teaching all of us how to be independent comic publishers. How do you get to the point of being a big publisher, noteworthy person, if you're not doing something to start getting it out there and, and having people see your work. I mean, it seems almost impossible. Yeah. You have to start at the bottom and that's the biggest thing is having the patience to start at the bottom right. <laughs> because we all want to, you know, go huge, but it's like I said, I, I do it cause I love it and maybe it'll happen, but maybe it won't. And if it doesn't, I'm going to keep doing it. I'm going to keep doing it until, until I can't draw anymore. Yeah. Yeah, so, I, I'm, I'm the yeah. same way. I'm totally with you. Well, I'm really excited, though, that, that you're getting those opportunities because I've always enjoyed your work. I've always thought you're a very talented guy. And being that you're also just like a really cool, awesome guy, I like seeing <laughs> those you. types of people uh, getting somewhere and being noticed and that their their work is not for naught. Um, but you oh, also, well, you. yeah, absolutely. Um, you also <laughs> have a Patreon account now. Is that right? I do. Um, I started it. Uh, maybe a year ago. I really haven't tried to push it, though. But I do have a Patreon account. Um, it's just patreon.com, Scott underscore Ledzinski, I think. Uh, yeah, it's underscore Ledzinski. And um, I have that. And then I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. Um, I think that's the... I, I have a Twitter, but I very rarely use it. it Twitter is not really an artist-friendly format. It's more of a journalist format, I think. Um, whereas Instagram, like you can show your work, you know, so it's right. a little more friendly to artists. Yeah. There was a time when Twitter was really great for artists, but I think that it just, yeah, I think it went more the journalistic site when, uh, when yeah. Instagram and, and, uh, Pinterest kind of took over a little bit. Um, and we'll have yeah. all those, uh, all those links obviously in the show notes as well. Um, but well, I, I have one you. more question for you because yeah. I, I was never a huge comic book guy. I have great respect it's it's kind of like opera for me. I have great respect for the amount of work and talent it takes to to do that medium. But I was never a big comic book guy because I'm one of those people that as much as I try not to, my eyes will immediately look ahead in the panels before I read the story. So right. how do you not do that? How do you get your eyes to really just focus on one panel at the time and as a reader and not spoil the, the story by looking at the picture? So... It's interesting you say that because here's the unique thing about comic books or, or graphic publications as a literary form. 
graphic novels, comics, whatever you want to call them, they are the only literary form that engage both sides of the brain simultaneously. So the fact that you're looking ahead is pretty normal. So you really have to allow, just allow yourself to read. Just remind yourself to slow down and just go panel to panel. But the thing that's beautiful about illustrated literature is that you can get the dialogue and then look at the setting and kind of just take each panel in, you know, as they unveil themselves. Because if you read a novel, you have to read the author's, you know, description of what's going on and where it's happening and what does this thing look like and what was that. And if you look at a comic book script, all that is in there. But then the artist takes that and interprets it into a scene. So then you get the dialogue that goes with, you know, whatever's happening in that place. So that's why in comics you have the big splash panels. And those are kind of your scene setting panels. And I would just encourage people to to really look at them. And and I, I guess I would say it's not wrong to skip ahead and just look at the artwork. But if if that's something that you're, you know, kind of struggling with, then just remind yourself to slow down and take in each thing. Because typically you have a writer and an artist, or sometimes a team of artists, depending on, you know, how the book was put together. And just allow yourself to read the, the, the dialogue and then absorb that scene and then read the next one and absorb the scene. And a good... A good team will only give you those big detail panels when you need them. And then the rest of them, you'll just have like a couple people talking or a very minimal amount of things within that panel. Um, I mean, there's some that, that don't do that, and they're beautiful books. Um, you know, there's uh, gosh, let's name it on. It's, uh, Lady Mechanica is a comic series. It's, it's steampunk. And every panel is just a work of art. Like, it's one of those things, that, you know, as an artist, I look at it and I'm just blown away. Because I, I think about the amount of time it must take for every single panel to be crafted. Sure. But um, I just allow myself to, you know, a little bit of time on each panel. And don't rush through it. You know, I'll let, let it be an experience. Um, so I guess that's how I would answer that, is, if it's okay if you skip ahead, I mean, I'll sometimes just thumb through it and look at all the art and then go back and read it. But you, and you don't find it spoils the story to do it that way? No, not necessarily. But I, I think some of that is my personal approach to literature. Like, my wife, if she starts a book, she can't help but finish it. Like, she has to finish it. But I've always been of the opinion that if a story doesn't grab me right away, I'll just stop reading it. <laughs> right, and yeah. I, I, there was one book in particular, I'm not going to say the book, but... I read it till the last chapter and didn't finish the last chapter. Like, I went up to the last chapter, and I was like, I don't care how this ends. And I literally put the book on the shelf. Wow. And my wife, she does not understand how I could do that. She was like, it'll take you, like, 10 minutes to finish it. And I'm like, yeah, I don't care. <laughs> I just don't care. <laughs> and yeah. so I... Um, some of it, I think, is just my approach to reading. I, You know, I've never been, like, a strong reader... And I think that's part of the reason I love graphic novels is I'm very visual and I was able to get into a story by absorbing the art. So by going through and just looking at the art before I read it, which I don't always do, but I do sometimes, depending on the illustrator. Um, I No, for me, it enriches it because I kind of know, like, I've looked at the artwork and so now I can read it and, and kind of look at it again without being too distracted by the artwork because I think I have the opposite problem where some people want to just read and they don't look at the art. I want to look at the art, you know? And so, yeah, I would just say find that pace that allows you to do both. I'm so yeah. glad to hear that that's normal because I, but, yeah. but you're right that they do like the establishing shot that gives you the idea of what world you're in, what's going on around you. And then everything or most of the things after that is a close up on the conversation. And yeah. I'm like, what's my problem? It's like five words. Why can't I just read five words before I look at the next <laughs> picture? You know, uh, right. but there was, there was one book that I, I think the, I, I can only think of one really that I stopped reading in the middle of it and didn't finish. And that was a book called Flatland. And uh -huh. it, it was about literally a, a, a world of non three dimensional life. And 
Uh I thought, but it doesn't make sense because even if the triangle, which is one of the characters that can move around, even if the triangle is flat, it still has, even if it's the most minuscule amount, it still has a height to it. It can't literally have no height whatsoever because if it's, if it's (laughs) even ink on a page, it has height. Right. And it just, I I just couldn't get past that. So I couldn't get into the (laughs) world that they were trying to sell me. I thought it was a neat idea, but it, I just wasn't into it. And so I just, sure. thought, you know. Well, and some of that could just be that the, it wasn't written in a way that grabbed you. You know, because right. if it was written in a way that immediately captivated you, you would stop thinking about, well, this has to have height. You would just be engrossed in the story. That's true. So it could just be the story didn't resonate with you. And just, you know. And so what happens is the story's not capturing you. And so you start thinking about other things like, well, this is impossible. There's ink height. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah, but I mean, there's there's things that if I'm just not buying the movie, and it's usually I find about 20 minutes in that there's something about the way that they're telling the story that just loses me. And and I'll give you the sure. example of the, the remake of Poltergeist that came out a few years ago. So here yeah. you've got this family and it's, you know, three young kids, uh, one's a teenager, and then you've got the mom and the dad. Well, the mom is working on her first novel. So she's not, she doesn't have a job. She hasn't published anything. So she has no literary income. And he just lost his job, but they just bought this six bedroom, three level house. How did they qualify for that? What mortgage company said, sure, you know, and that was at the point where they lost me because I can't, I can't even buy that. Like I would be willing to buy whatever poltergeist activity you're going to throw at me. I'll just go along for the ride. I'll accept that. But the world has to make sense because it's not a fantasy world story. It's a real world story. And so right. they just lost me. I'm like, well, I, I don't care about anything that happens now because you've just shown me that you can't tell a story. And the, it, I just didn't enjoy the film. I'm behind you 100% on that. Because when I watch a movie or read a story, I agree. Having that, that realistic scene that you're or, you know, creating a realistic world that you can resonate with the parts that need to be realistic, but go, okay. So this is a real thing, and then the ghost, sure, we'll accept that. Right. But I totally get where you're coming from there, because I, I experience the same things with movie where you watch something, and you're like, that's not real. What about the troll? Yeah, but the thing. It's, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but, but yet you watch Star Wars, or you watch Lord of the Rings. I mean, something that's just complete, made-up fantasy. And, and you just accept it because you're walking into the situation knowing that that's what right. it is. It's, it, they're showing you a world that you're not familiar with at all. So you're willing to accept whatever goes on in that world. But if they're going to show you something that's in the real world and put people in a unique situation that may be odd, you can accept that. But the real world part has to make sense. And, and to further right. that point, so at some point in the movie, uh, I, I think it was the way that they introduced the, the clown doll. And it was like they found it in a box in in the wall or something, and the kid hated it. So instead of just throwing it out or putting it in the garage or giving it to Goodwill, they put it in his room, this thing that really upsets him, and they're going to put it in his (laughs) room for him. What kind of parents are these people, you know? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. See, my my unrealistic movie moment was was in Dirty Dancing, believe it or not. When at the Yeah, it was just... So before I was a father, I enjoyed the movie. Post being a father, especially being the father of a teenage girl, I I watched that scene. Not too, well, Sharon and I rewatched that movie last summer, and when Patrick Swayze walks up and he goes, "Nobody puts baby in the corner," and he like goes around the dad and grabs her and like kind of takes her out of the corner. You know, there's the romantic in you that goes, oh, that's so cool. But then there's the father in me that goes, I would have punched that guy's mouth loose. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Right. No, I'm her dad, and I do put her in a corner. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know? yeah. Not yeah. that I'm a heavy-handed father, but it's just that thing, that protective instinct of the dad. You're just like, no, I've already decided that you're not right for her, and she's too young to make that decision. So, yeah, you don't get to dance with her at the end. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know that's, that's such a good point. And I think that's the thing is that we, we just tend to take the storyline. And of course, because we look at Patrick Swayze in that movie as being the hero, 
we just right. automatically follow his sides. And I always say, like, what would have happened if Star Wars had been told from the viewpoint of the Empire as opposed to the Rebels? The reason we side yeah. with the Rebels is because that's the story that we were presented. We were right. we were driven to to side with them. So in Dirty Dancing, you know, the father is the is one of the bad guys because he's not right. allowing Patrick Swayze to do what he wants to do, who is our hero. So we just, right. you know, he can do no wrong. Whatever he does is the right thing. And you're right. When you dissect it or when your perspective in life changes and you go back and look at that, you go, wait a minute, though. That's wait not right at all. <laughs> Papa Bear's claws are going to come out if you do that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I don't, I don't have kids, but now that you've said that, yeah, that's an excellent point. An excellent yeah, point. it's just kind of funny. I mean, you know, it's, it's a piece of fiction and whatever, but... It's just one of those, you have those thoughts. You're like, yeah, no, it's not how that would happen. Absolutely. <laughs> well, man, yeah. I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. It's been such a good time talking. And I'm so, I'm just so glad to see that you're, that you're one of those people that has been able to maintain doing what you love doing and turn it into something tangible. And, you know, thinking about you just drawing in notebook after notebook in history class <laughs> to, to the fact that you're not one of those people that said, well, I got a family now. It's time to be a responsible guy. I'll go to college. I'll get a corporate job. I'll be a lawyer or whatever it is. And, you know, it, it, I'm glad that you stuck with it because it's something that, again, like I said, it's not what you do. It's just who you are. Well, thanks. I really appreciate that, Scott. I really do appreciate that. And I, and I would reciprocate. Like, I'm so glad to see that you're still in music because one of the things I remember about you, one of the things that drew me to you immediately is you had that your your red hair down <laughs> to the middle of your back like and and you had i remember you had a deep purple shirt on and torn up jeans yep <laughs> and, and i was just like that's an interesting cat i gotta know that guy like I just, right and yeah so i was kind of like immediately just like i gotta know this guy and and one other thing i and I, I meant to say this earlier but um we were talking earlier about history class and me writing do you remember you gave me I asked you for a pair of worn-out drumsticks. You did, yeah. And I still have them. You do? They were the blue. They were blue, and then they were all, like, from hitting the rim. They were all white, like uh -huh. the resin or whatever they were made of. They're totally chewed up. But you brought me a pair of used drumsticks. And I remember when I asked you, you kind of looked at me like, yeah, okay. <laughs> and I still have them. <laughs> wow. I'm flattered, man. And, That's awesome. Yeah. So I just... Um, I just thought you'd like to know that. I still have the... I'm trying to remember. I think, I think I had it when I was in Michigan when we moved to Colorado. Yeah, I did. Uh, did I have the, the painted jean jacket? Remember we used to do that back in the day? We would paint like album yeah. covers and things back on the jean jacket? Yeah, you had that. Yeah. Oh, I still have yeah. a couple of those. My, my ex took one, awesome. the first one that I did. But uh, you know, the, the other two I still have. But yeah, those were good times. Yeah, definitely. So <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, man. We're kids of the 80s. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Different world. But man, keep doing what you're doing yeah. and uh, and come back and visit Thanks, us. Man. Let us know when you've got some stuff coming out and I'll send it out to uh, to the group and let them know. And uh, man, just, just keep doing it. Thanks, buddy. I really appreciate the opportunity and it was great talking to you. Absolutely. And good luck with the podcast. It's, it's great so far. I've been listening to it and I love it. So keep it up, man. I really appreciate that. It means a lot to me. Thank yeah. you. We'll talk soon, buddy. All right, buddy. Thanks. Yeah, what a what an amazing guy he is. And, you know, knowing him personally for so many years, even though there was a, a good period where we had lost touch, um, you know, he's just one of those most genuine, driven, honest, hardworking people that would, uh, you know, he'd do anything for you. And you, you sense a, a reality about the guy, which I absolutely love. And I wish him the best continued success. I'm, I'm glad he gets to do what he loves. As for me, I'm going to go do what I love. I've got to go work on this uh, film theme. Uh, it's for a Western, so I don't really do a lot of Western music. So uh, I've got to do some research and see how that's going to go. But in the meantime, thank you for listening. Please feel free to leave some feedback or a star rating on iTunes or Podbean or wherever you're listening. You can subscribe to the podcast and uh, through iTunes or Podbean. We're still working on the button for my page. But thanks for listening, and we'll see you guys next week.